part 13, the post-flood return of the Nephilim. Uh, many people try to point to Genesis 6-4 and say that angels came back again. And they say, because, see, it says, and also after that. So they'll say that they also after that means angels came back again. I'm like, no, it doesn't say that. Uh, and so I tried to help these people out by putting some things in parentheses there. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days. What days? The days of Jared, which is about 1,200 years before the flood. And also after that, that being what? The days of Jared. When the sons of God came unto the daughters of men. When? In the days of Jared. And they bare children to them. The same who were born in the days of Jared were the mighty men that were of old. And the word there is olam. That's a word used, translated hundreds of times as forever and everlasting throughout the scriptures. Long, long, long time ago. Uh, very long time ago. They were the men of renounce. So that's not the word Moses would have used for the guys that they just saw in the promised land last week. He's talking about the same word of old, of olam, a long time ago, pre-flood, right there. Uh, as I started to analyze all this in my second presentation I ever did publicly, it was called the Mount Hermon Roswell Connection, I came up with five reasons why I did not believe there was a second incursion of angels. First and foremost, because the judgment against the watchers was extremely severe. Second, there are no confirming witnesses in Scripture or in any other text. You know, how many of you know the Bible says you need two to three witnesses to establish truth? Well, if you can't find a second witness, you probably need to reevaluate your doctrine. By the way, I tell that to people who use Paul to say that uh, he's against the Torah. <laughs> I'm like, if your Paul fails the Deuteronomy 13 test, you've got a big problem. I'm thankful my Paul passes. <laughs> you know, I love Paul. But let's say you're right. Let's say your Paul is writing something different from everybody else in Scripture. Where's your confirming witness? Where's your second witness? Because I have a whole lot of other authors <laughs> that stand in disagreement to what you're trying to say Paul was about. You know, just an FYI there. Uh, but I couldn't find any confirming witnesses to any idea of, uh, of um, another incursion of angels. Size began to drop dramatically. When you have a direct angel-human hybrid, it says that they got to 3,000 L's. Now, depending on who you read, that's really big, upwards of 450 feet tall which sounds inconceivable. We can't even imagine a person 450 feet tall. The Greeks had no problem with it. They called it the Titans. <laughs> uh, in fact, if you've seen some of the movies like Clash of the Titans and whatnot, when they try to bring up, I think it was Kronos, from the underworld, he was 450 feet tall. So they were being actually true to the narrative. Um, they had no problem with it. What I found interesting about that is that height, 450 feet tall, just so happens to be the same as the length of the ark, 450 feet long. So the <laughs> I thought that was kind of poetic. The world should have become completely corrupted five times over in the time that we've had since then. In less than a few hundred years, Genesis said, earth and all flesh have become corrupted as a result of the first incursion. So why are we still here? You know, I don't think another angel incursion. And why science instead of sex? And that was there because of uh, people who talk about alien abductions. And anytime people talk about alien abductions, they usually describe it in terms of some sort of scientific experimentation taking place. Not copulation, but people having genetic material and reproductive organs tampered with and um, fetuses implanted and removed and stuff like that. I'm like, well, if all you had to do is have sex, why, why deal with all the science? All right, so those are the five reasons I gave there. God's judgment against the angels that sinned is detailed uh, throughout the book of Enoch, but it talks about in 1 Enoch chapter 10, and to Gabriel said the Lord, proceed against the bastards and the reprobates and against the children of fornication and destroy the children of the watchers from amongst men. Send them one against the other that they may destroy each other in battle. For length of days shall they not have and no request that they make of thee shall be granted unto the fathers on their behalf. For they hope to live in an eternal life and that each one of them, the Nephilim offspring, would live for 500 years. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go bind some Jaza and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them in all their uncleanness. And their sons, the Nephilim offspring, have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones. Bind them, the watchers, fast for 70 generations. Remember that. 70 generations in the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. Now, how many of you have children? How many of you would love to watch your children massacre each other? Nobody. That was part of their severe judgment, was to why, and it says they're beloved ones, so it showed that the angels actually loved their offspring. Part of their severe judgment, the beginning of their severe judgment, was to watch their own children massacre each other. That was before they themselves were judged. We continue. Um, do angels tremble? Do angels fear the judgments of God? Yeah, absolutely they do. 
Um, and we even see that in First Enoch chapter 6, 2-4. through four. The angels, the sons of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men and have children with them. And Samjaza, who was their leader, said to them, I fear you will not agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of this great sin. They knew what they were about to do was going to be a great sin. And he was already in fear that he was going to go ahead and do it and nobody else was going to go through it. They said, No, we're all in. You know, they took a vow there. Uh, and then Mount Hermon was named that because of that vow, apparently. First uh, Enoch chapter 13, 3 through 5. Then I went and spoke to them all together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. And they besought me to draw up a petition for them that they might find forgiveness and to read their petition to the, in the presence of the Lord of heaven. For from thenceforth they could not speak to him nor lift up their eyes to heaven for shame of their sins for which... They had been condemned. They were terrified about the judgment that was about to happen. Later, when the judgment is pronounced, Michael is like, you know, next to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Michael's the big guy up there, right? He's the power angel, right? Michael himself, the great archangel himself, is, says he's looking at what's taking place there and says, boy, this makes me tremble because of the severity of the judgment of the secrets of the judgment of the angels. And he goes on to say, you know what? No other angel nor man is, is going to have this portion, but alone they have received their judgment forever and ever. So basically he's saying, whoa, that's bad news right there. No, one ever, no one's ever going to do that again at, as he sees the judgment that is being opposed on his watcher brothers. So what happened? How did the giants come back after the flood then? Well, I began to try to, again, visually depict this, creating timelines and stuff like that. This is one of the charts that I created, the 350 post-flood years of Noah's life, kind of going through scripture and laying things out. And we see the same person, Moses, who wrote Genesis 6, again confirms that there was no other incursion of angels after the flood when he said a few chapters later in Genesis 9, 18 and 19, he says, And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Why did he insert that there? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Oh, and by the way, Ham's the father of Canaan. That's there for a reason. We've got to pay attention to that. Because Canaan is the one who fathered the Canaanites, who were, who was the, fa- the Canaanites were all the ites the Israelites were, were repeatedly to- told to utterly destroy over and over and over again. Verse 19, these are the three sons of Noah, and from them, of them, was the whole earth overspread or populated. The whole earth was populated by these three individuals. So, how did they return after the flood? Well, we see that right there. Again, the whole earth was populated. Chapter 10 is what is referred to by many people as the table of nations. This is where we see how the world was populated after the flood. And we get to chapter 10, verse 15. And Canaan begat Sidon, his first son, and Heth, the father of the Hittites, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Gergesite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, and the Zemorite, and the Hamathite. And afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. These are the same people that we see throughout the Torah and into the book of Joshua and even elsewhere that we consistently see God saying, utterly destroy them. Now, in combat, there, there were rules of war, right? I mean, a lot of times when you go to war with somebody, you could take the women and children and animals as spoils of war. And you see that in various campaigns that Israel had. But there are other campaigns that Israel had where he said, no, nope, you are going to kill the women, you're going to kill the children, you're going to kill the animals, you're going to burn everything, you're going to wipe out the whole everything. So what is going on there? I mean, either God is prejudiced, schizophrenic, and into random acts of genocide, or he's got a legitimate reason for wanting those very specific people groups completely annihilated. And I submit to you that this explains that, that there was something genetically wrong with these people that God's like, they were not meant to be here. Get rid of them. He, took, he got rid of the first batch with the flood. He left a few, and he said, you know what? I'm going to show myself powerful through my people. And we even see that he sends the angel of the Lord ahead of them to go take out the big guys, you know? So the angel of the Lord goes out there, takes out the big guys, leaves some still big guys left so that he could glorify himself through his people. Because what happened when Rahab uh, saw the spies? She talked about, wow, we are all in fear of you guys. We heard what you guys did, you know, to Sihon and Og and all this stuff. You know, these guys were giants. They were well-known people, you know, big people out there. And here's this Israelite group that got liberated from Egypt, and they're going around wiping out the giants. So everybody else is like, whoa. So he was making himself known through his people by empowering them to go up against them. My friend, Dr. Judd Burton, who's an archaeologist, he suspects, and he's done some interesting study on this, that various forms of martial arts may have been specifically created for the purpose of taking out giants. 
And he's talking about different forms of kung fu and things where it's a lot of very upward thrusting type motions and stuff like that that don't really make a whole lot of sense other than for show in a combat scenario unless you're trying to take out ankles, knees, and groin or whatever of a giant. Then all of a sudden they make sense. So yeah, we see the Israelites are in the wilderness for 40 years, but even in the Torah, when you get there, you see what happens at Sinai and the various you know, events and rebellion, you know, Korah and all that stuff. And then it almost kind of just jumps ahead to the end and, okay, ready, we're going into the land now, right? Well, what were they doing out there besides, you know, walking out the feasts and stuff like that? They had 40 years out there getting ready to go into a land full of giants. I think they were probably doing some combat training. <laughs> just saying. I mean, even David had to be ready for Goliath, right? He got his training as a shepherd before he went up against Goliath. So it's an interesting theory. Another interesting theory. Uh, how many of you guys know Chuck Missler? He's, he's since gone on, but uh, what an amazing man he was. Uh, he, he showed something. He was the first, you know, I don't know if he originated this or was the first to discover it, but he's the first person I ever heard talk about it by saying, uh, you ever notice that the, the meanings of the names of people, especially in the Bible, you know, their, their names have meaning, right? You know, Esau comes out red and hairy, so they name him red and hairy, <laughs> right? You know, heel grabber, okay, Jacob. Uh, so he's looking at the the patriarchs before the flood and the definitions of their names and you see their names right there in the corresponding definition and he says you know what if you put that together in a in a sentence this is what you end up with man is appointed mortal sorrow but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest wow that's like the entire plan of the gospel right there in the names of the first 10 patriarchs of the Bible when I first saw that, I thought, I wonder if that's the only place that happens. Well, I can tell you right now, it's not. It happens quite a bit. There's a book uh, called um, Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names. You need to write that down. A Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. It's a short book, and all it is is all the names in the Bible and what their names mean. So a lot of times when you come across genealogies, most of us, you know, our eyes glaze over and we're like, okay, so-and-so, we got so-and-so, and you can't pronounce the names, so you skip it? No. There's a gold mine of cool stuff that you can find. Not, not every time, but many times. And sometimes when you see the tribes of Israel, right, the 12 tribes of Israel, and there's a birth order, and if you put the birth order of, of their name definitions, it says one thing, but there are other times where God will mention the various tribes and he won't put them in their birth order. And it, so it changes the meaning of the sentence, the meaning of the paragraph. So I'm like, wow, this is like really cool. All of a sudden I'm getting jazzed out of my mind every time we, should, we come to a portion of scripture that has the, you know, names in it. So I, uh, now looking at these names right here, Jared, his name shall come down. Well, that's when the watchers came down. Enoch teaching, well, he taught against the watchers. Methuselah, his death shall bring in the connotation is judgment. Judgment is coming. He died seven days later. We had the flood. Despairing, well, he was born during the first generation, during the Clash of the Titans. So, yeah, I mean, if you're living during the time of the Clash of the Titans and you have an offspring, you're probably going to name your kid Despairing because what kind of life is he going to have growing up in this environment? After the Clash of the Titans, Noah was born, his name is Rest. So the names started to make sense to me. So then I went to Genesis chapter 10, and the names that I showed you a few minutes ago uh, are listed right here with their corresponding uh, definition, meaning of the names right there. Now it's kind of hard to put together a paragraph right here just looking at it this way, so I'll put it in sentence format here. Those are the same names, the meaning of their names right here. This is the paragraph you end up with. He raged a black terror, double straight afflicted trafficker. Black terror, drink thou anguish, compass the chamber, thunder, compass the smiting. He who is coming, their love, we shall rebel. That's Nimrod right there. A double straight firebrand, travailing, affliction of water, blades opening the moistened morsel. Forgiven ones bowing to spy, a trafficker hunting terrors, trodden downsayers, strangers draw near, showers of life, gnawing like thorns, they shall break loose, double woolen enclosures of wrath. That's a heck of a family tree. But now think about that. What, what proud parent looks down at his newborn baby and says, enclosure of wrath, what do you think, honey? Yeah, that's definitely what we're going to name that one. Terror. You, know, what? you look down at your kid, terror. You name your kid terror? Something's going on with these people. <laughs> For them to have named them these things. And just coincidentally, these are the people that God says, utterly destroy them. Well, there you go. The meaning in the names. Something's going on there. So again, depicting it graphically, looking at the offspring. 
uh, we see Ham has Canaan, Mitzrayim, Put, and Cush. Canaan's line, as we've just seen, is loaded with giants. There's one giant in Mitzrayim, at least one, none that I could find in Put and one in Cush, but he was, uh, I believe, genetically modified, and that would be Nimrod. Uh, and I've got much material on that. The many giants there, uh, the, the Amorites being the most significant of the Canaanites, uh, and in Mitzrayim's line, it would be the Philistines through Kaftor. Kaftor um, was a son of Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Kaftor settled the island of Crete. Crete was known as the island of Kaftor. Well, it just so happens that all of Greek mythology originates in Crete. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> I don't think so. And the Philistines came out of that. Of course, Goliath being the most notable giant, but he had brothers too, right? And other giants in Gath, six fingers, six toes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't find any giants in Shem's line. Yay. Because <laughs> who comes through Shem? Eventually, Yeshua. Uh, and I did actually find some in Japheth. Now, I didn't find this in scripture, but as I started looking at the line of Japheth and looking through history, I found that there are actually two very prominent giants associated with Japheth, and I wonder if uh, JP and Charlie might be aware of this or not, but are you guys familiar with the Lord Mayor Parade, where they marched the two giants of Gog and Magog through the streets? Yeah, you've heard of it? Yeah, created by John, uh, King John Lachlan, the signer of the Magna Carta, who all U.S. presidents just so happen to be coincidentally related to that one guy. <laughs> yes, uh, I think it was the Riverwinds said we need to be uh, politically active. I agree with that. But when it comes to presidents, I don't think we've ever had a choice, to be honest with you. Uh, I think you can go there and get your exercise if that's what you need. But when <laughs> we realize that all of these guys are related to each other, and related to one guy, eventually you have to say, these guys are selected, they're not elected. Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? What if Democrats and Republicans were two wings of the same bird of prey? Tonight, what if elections don't matter? What if elections were actually useful tools for social control? What if they just provided the populace with meaningless participation in a process that validates an establishment that never meaningfully changes? What if that establishment doesn't want and doesn't have the consent of the governed? What if the two-party system was actually a mechanism used to limit so-called public opinion? One young girl traced them all back to one common ancestor. They're all cousins and all grandsons of John Lachlan. It's the first family tree of its kind, pouring through more than half a million names for months. 12-year-old Bridge Ann D'Avignon discovered that all the U.S. presidents, except Martin Van Buren, are related to the former King of England, John Lackland Plantagenet, signer of the Magna Carta in 1215. She started with George Washington, but unlike other professional genealogists that only looked at the male family lines, Bridge Ann was able to link the presidents together using both male and female ancestry. Before this, historians had only been able to link 22 family trees. In, in my book, there's a lot of genealogical research, you know, going back, Dick's family, my family, these heroic and amazing tales of people who went west. But one of the things I discovered is that Dick and Barack Obama are eighth cousins. What? Is that an amazing thing? Yes, if you go back eight generations, really? they have a common ancestor. These bloodlines are literally able to be traced by genealogists all the way back to ancient Sumer and Babylonia. And these human familiars or pets of the demonic angels have worshipped Satan and his minions under many forms from the time of Sumer right up to our present day. The Bush lineage has blood ties to a great number of former presidents. George Washington, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Grover Cleveland, Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, Calvin Coolidge, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and Gerald Ford. George Bush Jr. is then found to be a cousin to both opposing candidates of his two terms in office, Al Gore and John Kerry. Democratic President Barack Obama also has blood ties with George W. Bush, as well as Gerald Ford, Lyndon Johnson, Harry Truman, James Madison, 
and the British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill. Let me take you through this, branch by branch. The 101st Airborne Division, Air Assault. <laughs> Vice President Dick Cheney, the man who's only a heartbeat away from the presidency, is actually a blood relation. He's President Bush's ninth cousin once removed. Cheney's cousin Barack Obama is also Bush's 11th cousin and the ninth cousin of Brad Pitt. But we're only just getting started. President Lincoln was President Bush's seventh cousin five times removed. And Bush shared more than just a ballot with John Kerry. That's right, they're ninth cousins twice removed. There's also royalty in the Bush bloodline. Princess Diana was Bush's 11th cousin twice removed. And then there's this bombshell. He's also related to Playboy founder Hugh Hefner, even Pocahontas, and Vlad the Impaler. What if the whole purpose of the Democratic and Republican parties was not to expand voters' choices, but to limit them? What if the widely perceived differences between the two parties was just an illusion? The Matrix is a system, Neil. What is the Matrix? Control. The Matrix is a computer-generated dream world built to keep us under control in order to change a human being into this. You know, um, anyway, that's my opinion on that. But I believe certainly on the congressional and local level, we need to be active. I still believe that there's hope there. Um, but so many, uh, you know, how many of you know if you get to a position of ultimate power, you're not going to give it up? And there have been certain families, not just in the United States, but certain families that are all related to each other that have been ruling the whole world. And the fact that our president has happened to go back to a guy who created a parade that honors two Nephilim giants <laughs> says to me, hmm, <laughs> something's going on there. Um, in 2006, I was privileged to go as a missionary to China, and as part of my time there, I got to sp go to the Great Wall of China and spend some time on that. What an impressive place that is. And while I was there, uh, and you can see in the lower picture, all those little dots on top, how big that wall is. Those are people on there. Um, that They said originally the, the Great Wall of China was known as the ramparts of Gog and Magog. Well, I mean, if you're trying to keep out six-foot-tall invaders, that's kind of overkill. You're trying to keep out 12-footers or 15-footers or something like that. Okay, the, the Great Wall makes a little bit more sense to me now. And interestingly enough, as I was preparing my presentation, the first one I did on this, a Geico commercial came out. Have you ever seen that Geico commercial? Where they, there's like these, you know, barbarian-looking guys, and they come up on the Great Wall of China, and it's like this tall, and they're like, hmm, what do we do? <laughs> and this other guy goes, Geico. <laughs> I'm like, wow, even Geico gets it. <laughs> Yeah, interesting. So there were giants in the line of Japheth, which also makes the prophetic scriptures of Gog and Magog in the last days. How many of you know Gog and Magog are making a comeback? I don't think it's just Russia and China. <laughs> I think there might be something else going on there. Now, I want you to notice, please, that I'm not saying that Ham is cursed. Not at all. A lot of people want to take that and run it off into all kinds of prejudice. It's not, that, that's not what I'm saying at all. Ham had plenty of children that were just fine. Canaan was cursed. Canaan was cursed by Noah, right? Not Ham. Uh, so not all of Ham's offspring were corrupted. There's no evidence of bad genetics, as I mentioned earlier, in Put's lineage that I could find. And I believe Put, if I'm not mistaken, translates to uh, the founder of Libya, if I'm not mistaken. Canaan's children appear to be loaded with Nephilim, as we've seen. There's only evidence of one in Mitzrayim's line that I, I'm aware of. However, it is interesting, though, that's the Philistines. But if you look at ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, how many of you have seen pictures of pharaohs being serviced by very short people? You know, you have these huge guys sitting on thrones. You know, something's going on there, right? Uh, so Mitzrayim may have had some more going on uh, than just Kaftor, but at least I can confirm in Scripture that Kaftor was. With the exception of whatever was going on with Nimrod, there are no Nephilim that I'm aware of in the rest of Cush's lineage. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.